Remember, hot and cold are relative terms. You know when water boils, it's very hot, but refrigerant boils at a much lower temperature. So the refrigerant can take on heat, change to a gas, and still seem cold. Again, the reason is because the two substances have different boiling points. Welcome to Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. We will see you in uh, about 45 seconds or so. Make sure that you are subscribing to our channels, our LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, turn on notifications, and we are very excited to be here with you. It's almost time, about 30 more seconds. Make sure to grab your notebook and pen so you can jot down notes along the way because at the end of the show, you could have an opportunity to ask our guests questions so we can dive a little deeper into these topics. And here we go. Welcome to Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. All right, everyone, welcome to Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. We are so glad that you're joining us today. We're gonna to spend a little time diving deeper into CO2 systems, because we're starting to talk about transitions in technology and transitions in refrigerant, and there's a lot of things for us to keep up on. And when we start talking about new transitions, it's always our goal to get the subject matter experts from the industry here on the show to help you understand what is actually going on. So today we're joined by Brett Wetzel. How's it going, Brett? How are we doing, man? Doing great. Love listening to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. We're so excited that you're hopping in here to educate the industry. Todd Clur, HVACREDU. What's going on, my friend? It's good to see you guys again. It's wonderful. It's been a little while. And Ty, yes. what's happening? Hello. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> oh, I love it, Ty. Brett, I took my first CO2 class in 2010 or 2011, and I've been really fascinated this whole time. And no matter how closely I look at it, I still can't see O2. Oh, I love it. Totally. We absolutely love having fun here. We're so glad everyone is joining us. We want to know where you're joining in from. Make sure to put into the chat where you're at. Stay with us along the way as we start diving into CO2. Ask questions, put them in the chat box as well so that we have an idea. I'm joining in from Brownsburg, Indiana. I just got back from the UA International Apprenticeship Competition. I think I brought COVID back with me. So I'm, I'm hoping Brett and, and Todd and Ty are going to run with this show. And I just get a, I just could be a smiley face in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ty, where are you joining at from today? We're in San Angelo, Texas. It's 104 today. 104. Man, that is kind of crazy. Todd, where? I know you're usually in, in sunny California. SoCal, so SoCal, uh, just north of Temecula, man. Eugene moved away from me. He, he just got up and left to Florida. What about a year ago now? So yeah. he, was a, he was a stone throw away from me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Kyle, thanks for joining us. David Harrell out there over in Cincinnati. We've got Liliana joining, Paul Leonardi. Yeah, so quite a few people. A yeah. lot of people today. Yeah. Glad to have you all here. Beluga. Yeah. Tom Leck. Man, we're going to have some fun today. So, yeah, hop in <laughs> and let us know. So, <laughs> and, so uh, David Harrell just had uh, surgery recently. But, man, I tell you what, if you ever get the chance to hang out with him, he is a fun person to hang out with. And I'm he's got a passion for this trade and education. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's, Brent, let's talk a little bit about your history in refrigeration. I mean, we've learned a lot from the podcast. There might be people out here that don't know your history with the refrigeration industry and what you do. And tell us like your segue into CO2. So, I, I've been dabbling in, I guess dabbling, I guess is a good word for it, uh, in, in commercial refrigeration for about, I don't know, 20, 22 years. Um, mm -hmm. Worked my way up from uh, actually what got a degree in electronical engineering to start and ended up transitioning into refrigeration. And so basically I worked my way from light commercial uh, into supermarket, into industrial, and then fell back in love with, with uh, supermarkets again. And I took my first CO2 class probably uh, about 12 years ago. 
and uh you know always been interested always you know always have been the why kid when you know why why is this why is that right and so i've just been deep diving into it and here i am i mean i you know I, we do the podcast and, and we just try to educate as many people as humanly possible right that's that's what we try to do I, I want everyone to go home safe and that's really what it comes down to and and you know co2 it is like a lot of uh, you know conventional refrigerants, but it also has its its intricacies as far as controls. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, I spent most of my career doing grocery rack refrigeration, so you know, working with older you know multi Copeland compressor racks, and then later working with a lot of the Hussman protocols. You know, getting into scroll compressors, and so there was a lot of transitions in there, and I loved it because of all the automations and controls. Refrigerants was just, yeah, we had a refrigerant change, we just changed refrigerants. And then we just reprogram things and off we went. But when we get into CO2, it's a little bit different scenario. And one of the things that I want people to understand is the prevalence of CO2 in our industry going forward. So coming back from this UA competition, so I, I met with, there was 2,300 and around 60 participants at this international conference. And one of the things that we encountered often was the CO2 integrations into commercial refrigeration. And the thing that got brought up the most was we have a, pretty significant workforce that is starting to get comfortable with CO2 installations, mm. but we don't have very many CO2 service technicians. Agreed. Would you agree with that, Brett? hundred percent. I mean, the, the, you know, it's, you know, everyone's trying to, you know, hit the, hit the mark as far as, you know, going away from chemical refrigerants, hitting the marks that, that are made by the EPA and, and, and just trying to get there. But the, Yes, it is a lot like conventional refrigerants. The only problem is, is that the intricacies of the controls. And that's one of the hardest things to really get around. And we'll dive into some of that stuff today. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you all for joining us. So we're going to spend a little time diving into curriculum and understanding what's happening with CO2. We're going to give you a bunch of resources for ways to get better with CO2 and curriculum to integrate into your programs. We had a lot of educators, even you know, like from UA halls that did refrigeration that haven't even touched CO2 yet. Mm -hmm. And they're going, man, where's the training resources on this? Because there's not a lot out there. And so we've had schools contacting us going, you know, we'd like to start teaching some CO2. We do a lot of refrigeration, but we don't even know where to begin. And yeah. that's what we're here to do. So I'm going to kind of hand the presentation over to Todd. He's going to right. run with the slides. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Let's dive into the introduction to CO2 refrigeration. Systems. Absolutely. So um, well, I don't know why it's not moving on, but let's try that again. There we go. So who <laughs> we are, we kind of gave a background about it, but I do want to give you a little bit of background about HVACRDU.net. Uh, what, we're going on 28 years. Um, I know Bryce is in the uh, sideline right here. You could say hi if he wants, but uh, Bryce is our CEO. Of course, we all know this uh, nice gentleman at the very top there, Mr. Chris Compton, the uh, founder of HVACRDU. And uh, we have over 20, I think it's going on 2,800 hours of online on-demand curriculum. That's a lot. And yes, and we're going to talk about you know, are collaborative with Brett. So, um, Brett, you kind of gave your inter your introduction, unless you think you need to do nope. more. Okay. No, <laughs> so, um, we're going to elevate you. The whole the purpose behind this training, uh, the CO2 that is, is to elevate your skills with uh, CO2 technology training, right? So, on unlocking you can ma master CO2. Of course, this is an introduction, right? So, we do have plans and visions to uh, take this to the next level. Start going talk about transcritical, etc. Um, but this training course is designed to get that your feet wet with CO2 training. Um, beauty about it, it's online on demand, just like all of our content. Absolutely. So and we've ahead, been working with HVACREDU for yes. .net for a long time. So this is yeah. a, a partnership that we do to help uh, train the industry and to make sure that you're getting the quality information that you're looking for. So I guess it's my turn. Uh, I'm going to take it away. So I wanted to give a brief history because a lot of people are like, oh, CO2, we've, we've never used that before. Yes, we have. <laughs> it was used well before the, 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 the manufacturing production of chemical refrigerants, you know, starting in all the way the first patent was, was back in 1850. Uh, it was utilized a lot in maritime refrigeration. Uh, you know, it was utilized. There, were, there we go. Ty's got it right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're going to have to send me that book later, Ty. Um, up until about the, the 1930s, because chemical refrigerants were, were produced and manufactured, I think, 1929, I believe. 28, I think. 28? Okay. Um, so then after that, they were like, wow, well, these chemical refrigerants are a little bit easier to work with. Let's let's stop using CO2. Um, 
it, you know, is the intricacies of control. And like I said, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, one of the main differences with chemical refrigerants versus CO2, uh, CO2 has a very, very uh, low critical point. And what, what that means is, is that we operate within a point where it's basically the Schrodinger's cat of refrigeration at that point. We don't know, is it a liquid? Is it a solid? Is it a vapor? It could be anything at that point. Um, so we have to mitigate our control strategies based off of that. So it, with the re, uh, reinvention of CO2 refrigeration technology, you know, it started being used a little bit more and more. Montreal Protocol comes around. It's like, hey, we got to stop using all these high OGP and and uh, GWP refrigerants. And now uh, I believe, I, th I think the United States is up to about 1,500 systems throughout the US. I believe like Europe, who has been doing it way longer than us and probably way better at this point, um, is probably, I think they're up to like 47,000 or 60,000. Yeah, a lot of systems. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, and we're well behind that mark. And, you know, you, you think about Canada too. I mean, they don't have nearly as many as Europe, but think about it, the population of just Canada resides just on that little border which is basically like the you know the size of california right so not nearly as many people over in europe so i mean it's it's coming it's been coming for a long time and you know unfortunately we're a lot we're really reactive sometimes absolutely a lot of people don't realize where we are with the hfc phase down so we're currently at 700 um, gwp in a lot of applications 150 gwp and many other applications including including automotive and some of our refrigeration as we continue to head down this scale of the hfc phase down and we start reducing those gwp limits we're going to have to start relying on more of our natural refrigerants like CO2, like R290, like ammonia, R600, 600A. Our low GWP counterparts are going to be the solutions going forward because our chemists will tell us we don't have anything else. You know, we just put out the refrigeration chemistry chart and you're looking at the actual periodic table. And I even had Dr. Chuck reach out and say, I'm, we're grateful you're doing this because people don't realize the periodic chart is not growing but people are expecting us to make more and new things and we can't do very much with what we have. So we're going to see a lot of CO2. Ty and I was just doing a, a class uh, was a few months ago with Sanobio Aguilera, you know, talking about the Sanco CO2 residential heat pump water heating systems. Mm -hmm. And people yeah, are like, very... whoa, I thought CO2 was only commercial industrial. And no, absolutely not. Hey, Simone, we're really glad that you're joining us from Ghana. We're grateful to have you here with us. Wow. Um, you're probably seeing CO2 coming into different places in the world. And so if you have seen any CO2 systems, let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're seeing for some of the new refrigerant, uh, refrigerant systems going forward. So uh, why CO2? I mean, like I just said, you know, we're, we're, we're shifting the CO2 because of the high GWPs, the high, high ODPs. You know, I, I gave you a brief history of you know, what's going on with CO2 and why we're heading back in this direction. Uh, current trends, uh, you know, have, have revived the need for CO2 because like you had stated before, Clifton, you know, the phase out of all these synthetic refrigerants because of their high GWP. Um, and it's critical to know how, how this, how this training, uh, how CO2 training and how HVACR, EDU and myself are filling the gap, trying to, trying to educate everybody out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, and that, and that gap is just basically the perfect partnership, right? Uh, HVACR, EDU along with Brett Wetzel. And so we take our award-winning great LMS platform that has, um, we have great reviews, especially with uh, live faculty and student services, right? So a student calls up, say, hey, I'm having problems with, uh, with my course and I need a little extra help. Live faculty will respond to them, get on the phone, a Zoom call, whatever it might even, sometimes even just email. It's that, it's that simple. It's, it's that quick. Almost like a tech support, but at a student level. Right. educational education yes and then of course our student services our registrar etc plus brett's knowledge a new a not too not too long ago a csme believe That's it or right. not yeah and uh so Ooh. we have a one plus two is equal to three so just you know we have this perfect collaborative here well, i'm just trying i'm just trying to catch up to all you guys that's all <laughs> So in making this course, uh, you know, what what's really involved in everything? Uh, I've gotten yelled at many a times by the ID department and they were like, hey, this is, you know, don't go too heavy on the modules. And I was like, there's so much stuff to learn. So yeah. one of the major things that I always want to do is safety. Safety is most important because, you know, we all have families to go to, right? So I want to make sure that you understand uh, how to how to treat CO2, identifying, uh, you know, identifying any safety hazards, you know, just like any other refrigerant, um, you know, 
it, it displaces the oxygen in the, in the lungs. So we want to make sure that, you know, dealing with exhaust, exhaust systems and everything like that, you're, you, you are safe in what you're doing. Uh, terms, uh, terms and uh, terminology, uh, this was a hefty section because uh, there's so much stuff like you know like yes a lot of the terms you know are, are old and and you know that they, they have been used before booster that's a, a, a system that's been done for years but we're re you know basically reintroducing it you talk to anyone that you know that's dealt in the commercial refrigeration clifton you can back me up the the uh uh two-stage con our, con our uh, booster systems that hill phoenix used to make right Mm -hmm. um Absolutely. you know you had 10, 10 pound suction boosting into like 48 pound uh suction and then boosting up to whatever the you know the atmosphere is gonna gonna give you on the condenser side right co2 properties and phases uh, we had to talk about it because i mean there's everyone's scared of dry ice my goodness it's gonna everything's gonna turn into dry ice and everything's gonna explode not really the case um so you, you know uh dry ice is really really hard to make uh, but one of the things that you have to be aware of is the critical point um you know besides the three little magic things that make this thing work. Um, it's basically DX refrigeration. It is. We still have expansion valves. We still have compressors. We still have condenser S type things called the gas cooler. You know, it's still, we still have the major components of the system. It's just, it differs just a little bit. Uh, knowing with the high pressures, uh, once again, knowing the, the critical point, I know I'm going to keep beating this horse to death, but I, I got to talk about it because it's the main component of this. That's what we're here for. CO2 piping, um, you know, because of the higher pressures, we have to mitigate that somehow. So now we use, um, you know, we can use either stainless steel, which is rather expensive. Oh, we can use stainless steel, but we also use a XHP copper. And you're going to think I'm making this up. Extreme high pressure. It's really what it stands for. Sure. So it's an iron clad copper. So you can take a magnet to it and it'll stick. Mm -hmm. um, leak detection. Right now, I'm breathing out. And if I had a leak detector right here, it'd start going off. Stud detector too, but leak detector as well. Oh, oh look at that. Be modest, be modest. Anyway, so right with, with, the, with the leak detection, with the leak detection, you know, it's it's sometimes really hard to find leaks. So I like within the system, within this program, I, I've basically give you some troubleshooting tips on basically how to go through and, le and leak check. Because there are so certain things that have thrown me for a loop, right? I was in a produce cooler. And try. Go ahead, Ty. Well, every time I go to the supermarket, there's always leaks there. It's right in the vegetable section. It's easy to find, right next to the lettuce. Hundred percent. That's where I was going with it. Except for that, I wasn't going there. I leaked. I just got it. Derailed train of thought. How you doing? Oh, we're good for these rabbit holes. But I was gonna say that there's leaks, but not the purple and white ones. But you know, basically, you have uh rotting vegetables rotting vegetables give off co2 so like you know telling you some of these things that could potentially rising bread rising bread yeah. you know how many service calls i've had where a leak detector has gone off in in you know in one of these walk-in coolers and basically i'm like oh well there's no leak why is there no leak well because there's not really a leak it you know i time it and i talked to the bakery lady and she's like oh yeah we you know we put the rising bread in there around seven o'clock and that's when the alarm went off that yep. is very, very important information when we start talking about refrigerant leak detection. See, I was the nerd that walked into my rack room and pulled up my E2 just to see if any of my sensors had any kind of trending whatsoever. And so if, if we're looking at our graphs and we're looking at CO2 detection, so when we say we're going to be doing a retrofit of a grocery refrigeration system, mm -hmm. and if I remove my traditional... Uh, you know, HFC or HCFC refrigerant based refrigeration rack. Mm -hmm. And I'm going with a CO2 system. Am I going to implement a CO2 monitoring system into that a refrigerant leak detection? Oh, 100%. Okay. 100%. You know, so the way with the way the piping is, you know, which I didn't really discuss the other parts of the piping. This is in the component section, but we have check valves uh, on a lot of the systems. So flow can't go backwards. So theoretically, if you have a leak, mo it, almost not, I want to say 100% of these circuits, as of right now, work off electronic expansion valves. So if they mm -hmm. sense a leak, they will get a shutdown circuit, shutdown signal going to the case controller and say, hey, stop feeding refrigerant. So no refrigerant can go backwards, which is great now. Hmm. Because, right. right? Because then it's basically going to trap that, trap that what would be liquid or vapor liquid. in there. So mm -hmm. it doesn't just keep pumping, you know, vapor CO2 within the system. You know, just like, uh, you know, in some states like New York, 
I think it's part of ASHRAE 15, but it, like in the state of New York, you have to have a liquid line solenoid and some sort of suction mitigation, whether it be a suction stop, um, whether it be an electronic EPR, you have to have that there. So in case you do get a leak, it shuts yeah, down. In, exactly. So A, okay. we're mitigating the amount of leaks. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the green chill type certified stores, they, mm -hmm. they have to have that some, some you know that type of, of leak mitigation because they're supposed to not lose X amount of refrigerant, right? But because CO2 is very high pressure, if you have some kind of crazy leak and you do have that refrigerant pressure going back, what's going to happen? It's going to fill up with CO2 yeah. vapor which is going to not end well for you. You'll have the wall was for a little bit. <laughs> All right. And those are the important things to talk about for even those that are comfortable with their rack refrigeration in the past, there is going to be some differences, not a ton, but there are things that are going to be different. And that's what we're here to talk about. And we'll talk, we'll, we're going to more. discuss those here a little bit, Clifton. Yep. Very good. So I cover different types of CO2 systems. I don't deep delve into it, but I give you, and you'll see in one of the other uh, parts of the presentation where I basically give you roundabout running operational guidelines of where they're going to actually run. Yep, um, if we start. I, I cover a little bit of cascade, a little bit of liquid pump overfeed, um, just regular medium temp CO2, uh, medium temp, or I'm sorry, uh, transcritical booster. I try, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ke uh, Kaiser Warren has a system called an FTE system, full transcritical efficiency, and it has all kinds of craziness as far as valves. Yeah. Cover that a little bit. So there's, with a bunch it's this is just to get you familiar with if you're looking at it, i was like i don't know what i'm looking at what begin yeah exactly so this yep. gives you okay you're working on a cascade you're working on a you know on a this on a that so this way you can actually tell the difference uh co2 components once again really really long section uh you know because i had to break down the different valves hpv bgv flash tank why is it not called a condenser why is it why is it called a gas cooler there's two different types of them there's only you know, like why why is there so many things so i had to make sure that i broke down everything uh co2 oil systems mm -hmm. as you know you probably know clifton uh, oil is one of the biggest biggest problems as far as yeah. maintaining and service calls on a rack and it yeah, throws absolutely. a lot of people for a loop there are at least five or six different types of oil systems uh, that you could potentially have. And I, I cover the basics of those and I, I cover how to, how do you add oil? Hmm. I mean, if, if I tried to add oil with you're not the, gonna pump that into the system, well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm pumping, you're going to have Popeye arms by the time. Yeah, exactly. Done. Exactly. 500 pound of pressure on this pump. <laughs> the seals out of it. <laughs> well, I, I, I basically give you a break uh, in this program. I give you a, 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 a valve by valve uh, scenario on like what you should do in order to add oil without having to get those Popeye arms that Ty has, you know? Fantastic. Um, defrosting with CO2 really not any different right you know usually off time electric and hot gas hot gas because of the cost factor um it's it's used frequently but not nearly as frequently as electric as right now uh has you know the 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 manufacturers are still trying to figure out like where their guidelines are. So right now they're making their cases for X, like X PSI, right? When they finally get certified, whether it be 90 bar, or 120 bar, whatever they actually decide on. At that point, I think uh, hot gas will be more prevalent. Come back into the consideration. Exactly. I mean, it's still being used in like the very big commercial uh, systems um, and, and some bigger supermarkets as well, but not as not as frequently as, as electric defrost, right? Sure. Pre-startup checks, evacuation, and leak checking. Um, mm. There are reliefs all over this thing, which we'll see in the uh, in the component section. But um, because of that, it's not like you, you're like, okay, let's just fill it up with 400 pounds, and then the whole system is fine. No, because we have the high side of the system where they have a relief on there that could be on a transcritical system. You could have as high as 1,740 pounds. Okay, but on the low temp suction, you could be as high as 435 for the relief. So what do you do? So now you have to basically segregate and isolate parts of the system in order to leak check as far as pressurizing the system. So we don't overpressure. If I just, you know, send it off and, and put seven, you know, 1500 pounds in there, I'm going to have five different leaf blowing and like never cool. get to the point where I need <laughs> right. to be. Right. Where's um, this gas going? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> well, you know, so someone, someone said to me, there's like, we're back in the days of R12. We just let it fly. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's another important thing to understand, too, is that we do have some ex exemptions for reclamation on a lot of our natural refrigerants. R290 was just excluded from the Section 608 of the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that ties actually got something. You ordered that off from Amazon, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What is that? <laughs> yeah, R290, straight from Amazon. Oh, 600A. Oh, 600A, yeah. And no transportation classification tags. And they're Interesting. Whole nother story. So, but the whole um, reclamation side in venting is something that we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at a little bit differently going forward with some of these natural refrigerants. Gotcha. Um, you know, procedures for starting up CO2. There, there has to be a certain way to actually start these systems up. And I'm going to get into it, which actually segues me right into our next section, uh, which is CO2 common operation and logic. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone, ha every rack has their own little thing that they do, right? But when starting up a transcritical system, like the sequence of operation for that is, we have to make sure there's no major alarms, no high pressure, no, um, no uh, phase loss, right? Then at that point, the compressors are enabled. Um, we start turning on two or three circuits. Because CO2 has such a high BTU per pound, we can't just turn them all on at the same time and hope for the best. You don't want to pull all that heat back? No. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it, it, it don't like it at all. Um, so you have you basically turn on a couple of circuits and give it uh, you know, um, 120 seconds, 360 seconds, whatever, and then you start turning on a couple more circuits Staging. and a couple more circuits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Staging is incredibly important with these systems. Once we get up to about 37, 40%, then at that point, then we'll start, then we'll enable the low temp circuit. And okay, now we'll start enabling some low temp, uh, low temp systems. And you might ask why? It's like on a split header, you don't have to do that. You can put them, turn them on at the same time. Well, it's not a booster system. You gotta remember the discharge of the low temp is discharging directly into the suction of the medium temp. So without the medium temp, I have no low temp. You have no, yeah. Exactly, okay. which is, which, kind of stinks sometimes because if you have a whole bunch of failures on the medium temp, you don't just lose the medium temp, you lose the low you temp. Lose as well. The low temp as well. Correct. Because there's no compressors to take the discharge temperature mm -hmm. of, of that compressor in there. Right. Yeah. Um, and then all these other manufacturers, they have different ways of superheat mitigation. You know, CO2 is very miscible with oil. Okay. So we have to be very careful with superheat. So tie in the days of, Oh, 20 degrees of superheat, you're straight, you know, and your compressor won't, will be fine with medium temp compressors. Yes. Low temp compressors, absolutely not. They require a minimum, regardless if it's Copeland, Bitzer, uh, Doreen, um, it doesn't matter. Those require at least 36 degrees of superheat going into the rear end of those compressors. The reason for that is because if you really think about it, the compression on your low temp is going to be 200 pounds on the suction and probably about 420 on the on the, on the discharge mm -hmm. going into the suction, right? So that's... I, I don't have a calculator, so I'm not going to do it. Compression ratio, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's very low compression ratio. And then on your on your medium temp side, you're going from 420 upwards of potentially, you know, 1,450 pounds, oh. 1,500 pounds. Exactly. A lot of so work you, on a compressor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, not really. Not really. It was three. Well, if you did it like rough math without mm -hmm. the three one, three three one. One. yeah, it's okay. really not that bad. And that's why we do it, right? Because imagine going all the way down from 200 pounds all the way oh, up. Oh, yeah. You try to put a, you know, seven, eight. Uh, compression ratio on it we don't have any in the market that can handle it 100 no. so scrolls or, or um uh yeah screws screw compressors yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, so wow. that's why we that's why that's why super heat mitigation is so important um the medium temp is creating more heat so it would require a less of a superheat than a something that's already running at like potentially minus 20 degrees saturated with a very very low compression ratio low compression ratio tie low what low yep. heat so, he, yep. So, hmm. well, we're gonna we're, we're gonna yeah we're gonna dive into some a uh, few of these uh both mostly uh the number six um and seven so difference of CO two synthesis and components yeah, you notice part. that there's eleven of these here mm -hmm. um and each one has we'll talk about the uh, the competency at the end and everything but for those who are listening stay tuned there's uh, something that might interest you at the end of the slideshow mm -hmm. presentation right. wink wink. Maybe. Well, everything Brett says should be interesting, anyways. Yeah, right. this is fantastic stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm glued here. So again, going, we're going to stick to uh, kind of dive into uh, four 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 six six and four four six seven. So uh, CO two systems and components. We're just going to give you a little thirty thousand foot. What's yeah. in here? Okay. So go ahead, right. uh, Brett. 
So transcritical booster system, I basically kind of explained it, uh, you know, giving you what a booster is, right? A booster system is is, is one that we're taking the discharge of, of one, the low temp compressor and then putting that into the medium, uh, the medium temp suction, um, you know, working in the transcritical range, which I touched on briefly. Um, once again, it's it's 87.8 degrees saturated which is at 1,055 PSI. That's the critical point of CO2. And so I don't like calling it a transcritical system because it makes it sound very scary. And not only does it make it sound scary, but not every system is a transcritical system, right? If you think about it, if it's in Alaska, is it running transcritical? No. Um, you know, think about it, right? You have... Um, you know, you have a, a TD, uh, if anyone doesn't know what TD is, it's basically the difference between, for condenser TD, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the difference between the ambient and your actual saturated condensing temperature, right? So if, you're, if your ambient is at 100 degrees and uh, you have a 20 degree TD, you're going to be operating at about 120 degrees saturated. Um, it, uh, for CO2, they have a lot of low, uh, low TD gas coolers which only give you a td of about five degrees so if you're operating at 72 degrees you're going to operate at around 77 degrees so anything if you have an adiabatic gas uh, uh adiabatic gas cooler like i said it only has a five degree td um if it's at 82 degrees you're essentially going to probably be running transcritical yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. A lot of people don't realize that there are critical points for all refrigerants. Just most of the time we stay well underneath well of under. that. So now we're just approaching that point to where we're getting to that critical limit where it doesn't like to jump back and forth between gas and liquid very easily. Yeah, 100%. Um, but, you know, I, I break down this is the, the, the ranges of, you know, what a medium temp compressor, you know, a medium temp uh and low temp booster could do as, as high on the medium temp as 50 as down low as maybe about 10 degrees and the same thing with the low temp we can go with as low as negative 36 um to as high as about you know 10 degrees saturated suction temp nice. so, so what i did i had so much fun with this and and probably redid these about 1500 times um <laughs> because i was like it's not good enough i need to do it better uh once again i talk about the efficiency of it you know which i i did before you know the reason why they're so efficient is because you know basically you have like what a two to one compression ratio and potentially a three to one compression ratio so instead of having like an eight to one or even a six to one you're basically reducing that yes there's more components you know so the upfront cost on a lot of these systems is a little bit more right i mean with the piping the components the the the, the boards uh you know um you know that that's that's what makes the makes it a little bit more difficult you have some of these extra components that that um a little bit more difficult to understand and so as you can see here uh you have your the black compressors um you have your uh your semi-hermetics at the top here uh discharging into an oil separator um going through the gas cooler going through what's called an HPV, which is that silvery looking valve by the receiver looking thing. And you can see throughout the the, the whole schematic here, you have reliefs all over the place. Um, going out of the HPV, that refrigerant thing goes into the receivery thing, which is a flash tank. Uh, because, you know, when you lower the pressure, uh, you know, coming out of the HPV, you could have potentially, you know, let's just say 1400 pounds. Well, they have to, re we have to reduce the pressure in order to get it to work within a, it's something that we can control underneath that critical point. So we drop that pressure approximately anywhere from 536 PSI to 490 PSI. Well, how do we do that? If we're dumping X amount of pressure in there, how do we mitigate that down? Well, coming out of the dash line, which represents a little bit of liquid, a little bit of vapor, that's called the BGV, um, that bypass gas valve. That valve basically then feeds refrigerant uh down nope down uh, coming one? out the receiver BGB. oh yes there you go that's going to feed the excess vapor that's then created because most of the time during subcritical operation you'll typically maintain about 30 uh, 70 percent of the liquid that you're creating and 30 percent vapor when you mm -hmm. run transcritical you're only basically producing maybe 50 percent liquid and 50 percent vapor oh okay so a lot of times you'll see maybe four compressors on a system Two will only run maybe when it's running subcritical. And then when it goes to transcritical, those other two will boot up. And the reason why is because you're creating so much more flash gas that it has to be a consumer of something. Like if you even look at an enthalpy chart, you'll see there, 
I don't have it on here, unfortunately, but there's whenever it makes a little triangle on the on the left hand side, that's showing that that's wasted energy. Yeah, and now you have to take away and mitigate. And that's yep. why you need more compressors. Liquid still goes down through the evaporators, gets run through into the medium that's temp. Compressors. Mm -hmm. So everything like if I take away the dotted line, I take away, you know, that that pretty little silvery valve up on the left hand side. This is a conventional system, right? Yeah, that's conventional what I'm looking boost. at. Yeah, that's every grocery store you'll ever walk into. Well, yeah, until sure. we got into the new you know, protocols and stuff, but every, yeah. every rack refrigeration system, that's what you're going to be looking at. 100%. 100%. And even before Brett started doing all of this uh, online training, he's always had a lot of fans. Oh. Oh, three, well, <laughs> six of them. And they've been running circles around him. They never <laughs> shut off. <laughs> I love you all. We have so much fun. I know. Uh, I so one of the in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that that uh, a lot of technicians struggle with, and they, they a lot of times they don't even know they exist, is the P and ID diagrams, right? Um, the piping, the instrumentation uh, diagram, right? They don't know what these things are, and it's sometimes looking at this, I'm like, I don't know what that squiggly line is. What's that little thing right there? Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. I simplified it. There we go. I basically broke down every single component. Not every single component, but most of the, uh, the most important ones, right? I'm not going to put every single ball valve on here. The, what the oil separator is. And usually when I teach, we don't even look at the rack. We don't look at the rack first. You know, we, we go through the components. We look through the sequence of operation, talking about how, like, there's a startup procedure and how it goes. Then we'll run through the sequence of operation through an a and id diagram, but usually they don't look this pretty. So they don't have all these components. So like, what's the line with the squiggly thing with the S? You know what I mean? <laughs> and these are really important because there's a lot of manufacturers have shutdown procedures. And as Todd had put down here, PNIDs are, are basically process system equivalent of electrical electrical pictorial diagrams. Absolutely. So you really break it down. Yeah. 100%. Like mm -hmm. I, when I go to diagnose something, if I've never seen the system before, give me a PNID, give me an SOO, sequence of operation. And if you got a program, I'll take it as well. Um, and the rack piping for the store. And I'll read that on the airplane if I'm getting flown out somewhere. Yep. And basically run through the thing. And so by the time I get out of the out of the airplane, I don't look like an idiot. You know, like, I don't know where that is. Because if you, it, like there's so many pipes on a on any CO2 system, you're like, I don't, don't, I lost, where, where'd it go? You know what I mean? Some of them do have arrows that are colored. LMP mm -hmm. is really good for that. Not but a lot. lot of them don't. Yeah. So... Well, you got to think about, you know, most of this is developed from engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. They are not always intended to be a service procedure, even though they really are when you know how to read them. Yeah. So, yes, they are a functional diagram for the layout and construction. But when you start looking at the flow, it, you know, it's a plumbing chart. It's like when I look at an electrical mm -hmm. schematic, I'm looking at a plumbing chart. If I'm looking at a plumbing layout for a construction site, I'm looking at yep. the flow of things. Mechanical, so it, mechanical you know, prints. It's absolutely what it is. So, you know, that's a, that's a whole separate topic. I, I think that could be a good show. Yeah, I like that idea. Just to, yeah, that's how to read a pain ID. <laughs> yeah. hey, I'll come back as, a, you know, as, as long as Ty gives me one of the little fingers, I'll come back. Um, <laughs> not, the, not the one finger. <laughs> so uh, we also cover CO2 components. This is the real lengthy section, you know, basically just to break down, you know, basic stuff from evaporators and compressors, uh, oil separators, uh, coalescing oil separators, liquid pumps, depending on what system that you're working on, right? Um, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. You're, the ID department was real mad at me for this one. Uh, they're like, why is there so much stuff? Uh -huh. oh, wow. I'm like, okay, because we have ball yes. valves, but then we also have CO2 ball valves. And, you know, and you're like, well, the fact that they can do CO2. No. Some of the ball valves actually have internal check valves with, with them. Because here, here, here's here's a scenario I'd like to run by you. You know, we, we talked about the PT chart, the, you know, the pressure being really obscenely high, right? So, Clifton, you know, you go to a supermarket, you have an iced up case. What's the procedure, right? You isolate the system, you pump it out, and you hit it with a hot water hose, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you have R22 running low temp, you're running at 6, 10 PSI, right? You hit it with 87 degree water, it might go up to 100 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We have 200 PSI in there. We hit it with 87 degree water. Now we got 1,055 pounds. Yeah. Kaboom. Wow. Wow. Service procedure then is absolutely. So different. once again, so we cover the service procedure, but so they have, mm -hmm. a, so in some systems, they have an internally check valve, ball valve. So if, even if it's isolated, 
if you were to hit it and the pressure on the outlet is great or less than what it is on the inlet, it'll Big bypass difference. around it. Yeah, it'll yeah, go. absolutely. To prevent, there's these little uh, uh, reliefs on every single evaporator. They look like little U's and they just release. So we don't want to do that. <laughs> that was that was a joke. I'm talking about the U-bends. They're just going to blow. <laughs> <laughs> so on this, you know, I broke down the different reliefs. Um, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, that is a relief doghouse. So you can see a lot of these different reliefs that I have labeled here and what, you know. Uh, what system. Yeah, and what system. So like the the big red and blue one, those would be something you'd see on like the discharge, uh, the discharge or the gas cooler, right? Those ones typically release at like 1740. Uh, the one with the little tag up at the top, uh, that can be 635, 435. Um, and then those two, yeah, those two right there, those are compressor reliefs. Typically on the compressor, even though the main relief blows at 1740, on those, on the compressor ones, and I'm not sure about every single manufacturer, but usually it's about 2180 is what those relief at. So if, if you were to be on a system and it went into a high pressure event where, it, you know, it, it just shut down before it actually hit the relief. And then you're like, oh, there's a problem with the compressor. You isolate the compressor and maybe you forgot about the crankcase heater. It's going to keep continuing to heat up that refrigerant. And what's going to happen? <laughs> it's going to do something horrible to that compressor. That's why in a lot of these transcritical systems, you'll see, uh, you know, usually on a regular uh, semi-hermetic, you'll see a bolt every inch and a half, two inch, right? On a transcritical compressor, it's like every like half inch. Like you can barely get the socket on all the way around to keep that pressure in there. So those yeah, ones relief at around 21. What's that? Keep those gaskets contained. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, a buddy of mine was starting up a system and he called me up. He's like, yeah, yesterday was gasket day. I'm like, really? What happened? He's like, wrong, wrong relief on the low temp. And, and those compressors, because they, they use something uh, yeah. comparable to like a 410A compressor on on the uh, on the subcritical side, right? Think cool. about it. It's, it's right. about the same it's pressures, pretty, right? Yeah. 200 pounds, 400 pounds. I mean, that, that's really not crazy different. I mean, a little bit high on the suction for, still for 410A. Pressure. It's not horrible. No, but but that's what I mean. Like, it's it's, it's very, very comparable. So um, there, there was supposed to be a five or 435 relief and there was a 635 they, they messed up the numbers <laughs> and so he's like yeah yesterday was gasket day yeah. <laughs> so being able to identify some of these things go back real quick Todd. all right um so the reason why we have a relief tree once again we talked about leak detection right and and, and the safety concerns right so all the co2 if we were to have it is going to vent and be outside because we don't want the relief venting you know within the facility Go ahead, Absolutely. And, go and relief valves are nothing new to refrigeration or air conditioning systems. A lot of people don't realize this. Even most of your residential systems will actually have some type of a relief device, which is just a safety pressure relief in case you get to an extremely high pressure. You can walk into grocery stores and we've got relief valves in a variety of places, but typically they're not ran to the roof because it's not been as much of a concern with the actual refrigerant itself. It's typically yeah. going to dissipate into large space. And with CO2, we're just going to make sure that we're going to get those to the exterior. If you've ever walked on a grocery uh, uh, roof before grocery store roof, yes, you're yeah. going to see relief valves on every refrigeration rack that you're going to encounter. So now we're just going to have more of them with different pressure ratings, depending on where they are in the system. It's just I mean, crazy. there's there's relief valves on virgin refrigerant tanks, Absolutely. right? A, our A1s had, had have discs. And yeah. what do the A2Ls now have? Yeah, so they're going to have a rupture relief valve. Yeah, so they're it's going to open until right? the pressure gets back down, which you've seen that one diagram. We actually exactly. had one on that previous cutaway of that relief. It's yeah. just designed to get you back into a safe right there. operating condition. That's all. Yeah. Good stuff. So uh, one of the things that differs, and, and before I really kind of uh, delve into this, that thing where it says warm, dry air and cold, humid air, what does that kind of look like, Ty? Looks like uh, from a cooling tower is what it looks like. I want to say guys from down south. He, he doesn't see humidifier pads. Nope, I don't. But I, but I do see swamp coolers. And guess what? Looks like a, like a swamp cooler pad. Swamp, it looks like a swamp cooler pad or a humidifier pad for a house, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's essentially what we're doing with adiabatics, right? You know, we're, we're, we're dripping water across there to get, uh, you know, essentially a lower temperature in, in wet bulb temperature to get more capacity out of the air in order to basically try to keep a system run in subcritical as long as humanly possible, right? Because like I had stated before, it takes more energy once we get into that transcritical phase, uh, you know, or transcritical state, um, you know, we produce a lot more flash gas, right? So 
we need to turn on more compressors in order to mitigate that pressure. So in order not to do that, we, uh, you know, we, we, we have the adiabatics to try to, you know, mitigate running into that, that transcritical state as much as humanly possible. Um, they do call it a gas cooler because there are some times where it, that's all it's doing. It's de superheating. That's the mm -hmm. only thing it's actually doing. So everyone's like, Oh, it's the condenser. Nope. Gas cooler. Mm -hmm. But it, but it does condense. I, but gas cooler. It there, doesn't condense. Brett, now are there states or regions where it's a condenser all the time? Well, it depends how hot it gets, right? Mm -hmm. um, like if we we're in Alaska, yeah, right. Uh, me, no, I would uh, maybe uh, now Wisconsin still gets still, still gets above the eighties because like we stated before, like with the TD, right? If it does, if it does have a five degree TD, w once you get to eighty two degrees, even with a low TD adiabatic gas cooler, you're still going to run right at transcritical, right? right? So mm -hmm. some place where it doesn't get, you know, eighty two degrees, will you know we could potentially run subcritical all year round. Um, go ahead, next slide. This is just a little bit more of a diagram just to kind of break down uh, what's really what's really happening here. You have a water distribution system. So it's, it's, it's different than a conventional uh, uh, evaporative condenser. Evaporative condenser, we, we typically, you know, put the water over the, uh, over the actual tubes, which requires water treatment. Uh, this doesn't require water treatment um it has its own self-sustaining pump pumping that that air uh, i'm sorry that water up into the uh the feeders dripping over those pads some are more advanced than others some just circulate constantly some actually have uh humidity and dew point temperatures to see how much water that it should mitigate through there in order to utilize the most amount of water through the passes because think about it like you you know with any kind of water cooling type device um leaves back leaves particulates right you know you're you're evaporating that water Don't you're you're solid. causing calcium chloride you know what i mean to, to build up especially on these pads so places that really kind of need it like vegas might have really bad water so the more you evaporate off the more particulates that looks like an old trucker stop right. coffee pot in the bottom you know what i mean hmm so we're actually going to use enthalpy to calculate variable speeds for pumps in these scenarios. Yes, you, you could do that, or or maybe just a, a flow, like a Belimo valve, to to mm -hmm. mitigate how much water we're actually putting across those pads. Very cool. Just, some some systems they don't have a pump where it's just whatever water that they are calling for, what it's trying to do with the enthalpy outside. That's what it's going to try to do. So if it just has to release a little bit of water, that's what it's going to do. If it has to release a lot of bit of water, because oh, it's wow. trying to utilize um, as much of the water as possible, because water sure. is a commodity like anything else. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So some of these are you know non recirculating systems. They're just direct water flow. Some. In, in, some. Okay. You know, I have have there been any questions that came through? I mean, if the, anybody wants to chime in, otherwise we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end too. I haven't, but make sure okay. to let us know as we're going through. There's still quite a few people out here. I'm sure there's some questions. Yeah. I feel like when I talk, everyone's not listening or they just tuned yeah. out. They, they're here, so they're listening. Otherwise, All right. they wouldn't be around. <laughs> so this is the, the basically the brainchild of the, of the whole uh, uh, system. Uh, this controller right here, whether it be a Danfoss, whether it be a Microthermal, whether it be a Corel, whether it be a, a, a Copeland iPro, they all basically do the same thing. Uh, you know, this controller controls the HPV and the BGV, and they, they control them together. And there is a reason for that. And I'll get into that in one second. Um, this system right here, or these systems, what they do is uh, they control. So first, I'm going to start to talk about the HPV, which is that little itty bitty valve. We'll see it bigger on the next one. OK, you already got it. Okay. Uh, what that's trying to do is if you look at the, the, the little picture on the left, that is a that's the HPV. It's just a different style of HPV. It has a pressure transducer right at the top there going to the controller. It also has a drop leg temperature sensor. Mm. Typically, this is a, a, a formulated way to try to figure out, uh, you know, what the saturated condensing temperature is. So what this controller is actually doing in subcritical operation, it's actually looking at the drop leg temperature sensor. And then it's like, OK, I'm at 75. So I might have a set point of five degree subcooling. So it actually is a subcooling mitigation valve when it's running subcritical because it knows that there's actually being liquid created at that point. It's not the Schrodinger's cat, right? We know that we can create liquid at this point. So we have the actual drop leg temperature sensor. Let's just say it's at 75. So theoretically with math and a PT chart, doesn't take a scientist, we go five degrees above that as far as our saturated pressure. 
So that HPV is mitigating and trying to regulate a pressure of 80 degrees saturated, which gives you five degrees of subcooling. Five degrees subcooling. Yep. Correct. Now we still have a flashing effect going off. So even though we have, you know, probably hundred percent liquid backed up into that line, we're still going to flash off when that thing opens up. Right. But for all intents and purposes, we have liquid on the inlet of that valve. Then when it uh, goes into transcritical function, because like I said, Schrodinger's cat, we don't know. Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? Is it a vapor? I, with plasma, we don't know what it is. So the operation of this thing changes just a little bit, a bit. Go back to, sorry. Um, what it's going to do then at that point is then take the drop leg temperature sensor. And even though there's no PT chart that physically exists, there's a bunch of smarter people than I that basically were like, well, well we, we think that this... What's that? Yeah, calculate some kind of assumed midpoint in that. Yeah, uh, calculate uh, what they think um, a PT chart would be yep. above yep. the critical point. Yeah, exactly. And actually, funny story about that. Todd, Todd, and I were talking about this, and and we were we used ChatGPT the other night to make a fictitious critical point chart for 404. We were we playing with the PT chart because I made a transcritical 404 system the other night, and I was like, I wonder if this could do it, you know? And that's and it, it did. It was pretty pretty interesting. So once again, when it takes the drop leg temperature sensor at that point, and then we'll potentially try to just operate at that pressure. So if it's a, a, a 90 degrees, I forget what the PT conversion is, what the algorithm is, but it'll try to maintain that saturated because we don't really care about trying to subcool anything at that point because it's impossible because we're in that transcritical form. So it just becomes a gas cooler, a basically a D superheater at that point, just trying to remove as much heat as humanly possible, right? But it not only does that, next slide, please. Um, it also controls the BGV. And like I stated before, we try to maintain a certain pressure within the BGV because it's going to affect, you know, with the way enthalpy works, it's also going to affect the sizing of the system, right? Because yeah. we know from experience, we know that the greater in gap between our saturated suction, and our saturated condensing temperature and like subcooled liquid, the more flat or the less flash gas will be created if we can get those numbers closer, That's right? True. Yeah. And so we have a saturated mixture in there. Um, you know, I, I, I try to, I had a real hard time wrapping my head around this when I first started learning this. And I was like, man, this doesn't make any sense because how do we have subcooling and then it disappears? And I, and I tried to explain a flash tank is almost like a, a recovery cylinder. You know how sometimes on the recovery cylinder, sometimes you have the blue that's labeled liquid and the red that's labeled vapor. Like they, backwards. Yeah, the ones that they messed up. Yeah. And if you accidentally, like I have, pulled off of what I thought was the liquid, you end up pulling off the vapor. And what happens? We drop the pressure the within pressure. the vessel, drops down to the saturate, and then it gets all freezing cold. Like I broke the refrigerant. Now it's cold. What happened? That's how a flash tank works. So, but when we drop it down to, let's just say 35 degrees saturated, that whole, mm -hmm. that vessel, that, that flash tank, flash receiver, whatever you want to call it, is essentially insulated for that reason, because it is going to get as cold as whatever pressure that you're going to get. It's a saturated mixture. Hmm. At the bottom, you have true blue liquid. And it actually, sometimes you'll see in the side glass, you'll see a little bit boiling off. If you're right at the right at the top there, you'll yep. see bubbles actually coming on the top because it's basically boiling off that refrigerant. Um, but this, this the controller is also controlling this. And th there's a reason for that. So if the flash tank, if we have a problem with the flash tank getting a little bit too high, higher than outside of its parameters, yeah, well, what are we going to do? Well, if we get too high, pretty that pressure. little pretty, pretty relief is going to blow. Mm -hmm. But controller smart enough where it's like whoa too high some yeah so it, it starts closing down the hpv mm -hmm. so sometimes people will call me and they're like hey brad i got a problem with uh i got a problem with the system going off on the on the high pressure valve on the hpv and i'm like what's your flash tank pressure he's like i don't have a problem with the flash he's like i think you might because what it'll do is if the flash tank pressure gets too high it's like oh no just close it down so okay. you know essentially you could have a high pressure issue because of uh, poor cycling or poor, uh, poor, uh, poor mitigation of that actual valve. Because we try to maintain about 12 to 15 PSI of, of range in these ranges. Because, I mean, a lot of these things, you can see there's a little VFD hanging out on the side there. The reason why is because so many BTUs per pound. So we need to kind of mitigate that a little, like, as quick as humanly possible. We need to oh, cycle, oh, cycle down. You know what I mean? We, want it, we never want anything to really just to shut down unless it's a very, very drastic drop. Um, so that's why those controllers together. Uh, someone else asked me the other day, like, well, what happens if you have a, a shutdown? And I was like, well, both valves are going to close down. Well, the reason for that is if you have 1,500 pounds 
and the 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 uh, gas cooler has a relief of 1740 and the flash tank is supposed to be at 500 some well guess what if that valve doesn't shut down the flash tank has a relief of 635 right. we're going to release the and flash tank. start warming up and pressure yeah 100 hmm. percent. so that's why they're kind of inter interlaced together go ahead next one man. all right well um so out of all these modules, we just kind of give you a 30,000 foot, you know, just kind of what's in some of our core or some of the modules. Again, there's 11 of them for this introduction course. We are going to release some additional courses in the future. Uh, how soon? I don't know. Let's uh, go to talk about that, Brett. <laughs> but uh, at the end of every module, there's a, a, you know, you gauge your competency. You kind of learn, you know, you read something just like a, a chapter review, questions, right? And gauge your competency. And then, of course, at the end, you have a final exam that you might want to say um and then of course you get a certificate a nice little certificate that says hey hvac excellence accredited etc cetera, etc cetera. and um with our logo on it and your name and the ceu h's uh C ceus and ceh's rather and what's beauty about the ceus and ceh's is you can use those for industry uh reasons that you need for your continuing education continue credits. education yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. so that's uh that's a beauty about them a lot of them are recognized uh we're recognized with several uh several entities and how, uh yeah how many, how many hours in accreditation is actually within this course yeah, 33 right and it's it's really small you can see it because i made it really small because the sample i had to put oh, a sample okay. on there but uh nonetheless it's 33 because our courses or modules are centered around three-ish hours a piece okay and that means yeah it doesn't mean that everything's gonna take three hours usually i can yeah. get most students to get through a, a module at about an hour to two hours somewhere around that range okay to be how fast they read it's been how how much they know already well i mean think about it the the each each um exam at the end of the module is 45 minute timeline well, if somebody takes 40 that's that's an hour right there right almost right you get set up or anything so it's that's an hour Plus any hour to hour and a half, maybe going through the, through the content, getting accustomed with it, looking at any, uh, any other assets that we might have. So there's your, that's where we get this three hour arbitrated number of three hours. Again, most people kind of get through it in about two hours. But point here is you get a, a credit for three hours. Well, three times 11 is 33. So you get 33 CEU CEHs. And so this was just a piece of one of 11 modules. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's, we're going to, Brett and I need to get on the horn and start to uh, start developing the next, uh, the next course. All right. But speaking um, of courses, um, yeah. you know, besides the questions and answers, which I'm going to go to next, uh, stay tuned after questions and answers, maybe some dad jokes. And uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll um, give you a, a nice promo code. So we're going to discount this pretty heavy for you. Oh, um, and we're excited about it. And uh, as, as should you, because there is no other uh, live or not live, but on demand 365 days a year access to your content. CO2, that is CO2 online education, 365 days, 24 seven, 24 seven at your disposal. Fantastic. So All questions right, and answers. Questions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know it's been quiet with questions and answers. So I'm, I'm curious enough that they're working. The chat. I've got working. so yeah, many good. of my own. I'm sitting here looking at that and I'm going, oh, is that VFD just running off compressor discharge temperature? And I'm talking. Yeah, because well, <laughs> yeah, we know what, you know, got a constant compression ratio. I could go on and on. I, I think the yeah. important part was that we showed you that the CO2 refrigeration system is only slightly different than a traditional refrigeration system. And so we're wanting to remove that scare. We're wanting to remove that fear to get you involved with CO2. Because if we think about this, if we're looking at CO2 programs for our school, if we're looking at CO2 programs for our union hall, if we're looking at the next step in the evolution of our career, CO2 service technicians are going to be in the utmost of demand in a very short mm -hmm. period of time. So we must start training on CO2 and other low GWP and natural refrigerants in a very quick period of time. And yeah. we have we have got the the formal invite to to present at the educator conference, but Brett and I might be uh, teaming up to do something similar to this yeah, and right. draw I'm that gap, draw that gap of the synthetic to CO2. Yeah, because we are going to see Brett. What not you? Um, since all the manufacturers have got Copeland in on it, um, Van Foss, they have the trainers they send around, so everybody's been in on this. But what not you that's telling me that another country got mad because Apple is going to put in their own rack system? 
<laughs> or I'm gonna call you later so you can explain some of these dad jokes to me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, well, you didn't like the Iraq. <laughs> hey, before oh. you know, <laughs> I, was, I was I was hung up on Apple. I'm like, why Apple? Oh my god, that I didn't get. Go ahead. No, really, no questions and answers from, from anybody. I'm surprised. Oh, there's a good one, Robert. This is a fantastic okay. one. I'm glad you mentioned this. So a, a couple months ago, Ty and I did a uh, did a presentation with Cenobio Aguilera from the Center for Technical Education, I think that is CTE in California, and they had one of the Sanco CO2. So it was a compact air to water residential heat wow. pump water heater. That's cool. Already on the market, being released across the nation. It was brought in from technology that was utilized in Europe. Because in, in Europe, they're in especially Australia, they have a lot of CO2 water heating solutions for residential. So right. CO2 is not an uncommon refrigerant. We've actually seen Mercedes-Benz release CO2 air conditioning systems. Chillers. Their yeah. Chillers. Yeah. Chillers. Uh, there, uh, there's a gentleman that I know, uh, you know, I, I keep bringing up Alaska because this, this guy, uh, uh, pro refrigeration, he installed a CO2 chiller. And because CO2 creates so much heat as far as enthalpy, when it's running in the transcritical state, like even though in Alaska, they really don't need to run it that high. Mm -hmm. They do because they actually were able to reduce the amount of uh, liquid propane, I think by 91 liters or something like that oh, of wow. propane because you're, you know, because it's a dairy, right? So you're, yeah. you're basically refrigerating the product, you know, for, you know, uh, for that process, but then they need heat for, yeah. you know, for heating up the milk and stuff like that, you know, for, for pasteurization and stuff, hot water, cleaning, potable water. So they reduce their, uh, you know, it's almost, almost a zero net gain, right? Cause they need wow. the, they need the, they need the, the, the chilled water, right. For their process cooling. But then they also need the heat for a lot of the other stuff mm -hmm. to answer his system. So, uh, Riva Cold and a couple other uh, different European manufacturers are, are, so that big diagram that I that he had that Todd had up um, mm -hmm. basically shrink that down to uh, basically like a, a Copeland XR uh, XJR system. It looks almost like a mini split. It has really? they have fractional transcritical compressors that look like what? a Tonka boy oh. about here. And so like it, they're they're they usually are powered by Corel. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, but yeah, so they have a miniature little flash tank. Uh, they have a miniature little, uh, transcritical compressor. The lines are, I, I don't know what they're made of. I haven't seen one up close yet. I, I, I I'm on it. Ty, I think I need one. I'm pretty sure there was a, a Coke machine that used them, but it said that yeah. you couldn't operate it above uh, 80 degrees without a big warning sign on it. Yeah, I that's the, that. and I guarantee you, Ty, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the gas cooler was probably huge on it, right? Because it probably it had to have that low TD because once again, so the trainer we, ha we have at one of the training centers, um, because of the, it's, it's uh, made of stainless steel, like every part of it. We, we've actually did an experiment where we closed down the uh, the uh, BGV and <laughs> opened up the HPV and it ran like a conventional R22 system. Because, I mean, that's, as it's long as it's not running in that transcritical, we really don't need the HPV and the BGV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're just controlling so, it when it's in that. You know, it makes me wonder. You know, it makes me wonder, is this, are we giving a call out to North Park Innovations and, and iConnect to make a tabletop CO2 trainer? Is that what I might have to talk to Bill. Yeah, I actually had a similar conversation <laughs> on the commercial unit. So, well, yeah, that's that. easy where I was going. That's right. <laughs> I, I want to be a part of that. Just to let you know that right now. I want to be a part of that. I know a All guy. Right. I'll continue that one because yeah. we've got Mitsubishi. All right. Well, unless there's other questions, yep. I'll give you the, the promo code Let's up here. That. Here you go, everyone. So, you know, kickstart your training exclusively in time. We're going to probably fly this uh, promo code right there, CO2, uh, CO2 intro 15. If you scan that or you can go type the type this uh, URL in. that's up to you. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I love Ty. I do too. It's Vanna White there. Let's get some Vanna White. Where's the music? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you need to get your roadcaster set up with, with Vanna White or some Vanna White music. So yes. Wheel of Fortune. Anyway, but type that in. It doesn't matter. It's, it's not case sensitive. You can you know do whatever you want. But um, scan that. Type type that at URL in, and it's a fifteen percent off. So um, probably going to go till the end of the end of August. So uh, okay. those who aren't watching this live, you know, if you want to watch this later on, there's your promo code. Scan it. Take it. 
I guarantee no disappointment and uh, more coming soon. Fantastic. So speaking of which, do we have yeah. some time for some dad jokes? I do. I do. Let's, let's throw one in there real quick okay. uh, and then we'll be able to, I'm going to have to call it quits here in a minute, but hold on just a second. Let's see if we can, we can roll right. that out. ACR dad jokes. All right, go ahead, Todd. Oh, me? Oh, I thought you were going to set them up. All right, well, I got some. So what happens when CO2 systems hears a bad joke? Hmm. When it what? What happens when a CO2 system hears a bad joke? When a CO2 system what? Hears. Oh, gosh. <laughs> see, <laughs> took me a minute. I thought he was really saying that he couldn't hear me. <laughs> Oh gosh, Ty, Ty, Ty. You haven't worked Ty. around him long enough. Yeah, I know. I don't know, Todd. <laughs> well, for Please those of you, we, we were talking about uh, uh, relief, relief uh, valves, right? So mm -hmm. it just blows, it blows off, it blows it off in a release event, a release event. Event. <laughs> uh, any more? All right. One more, just one more for the for the for the road. Yeah, I, I, I'm out. I'm out. Why? I'm why? Out. Why did? Why did the CO2 system get into trouble at the party? Yeah. All right. Mm, because it couldn't contain itself and oh. had a massive release. <laughs> Love it. All right. All right. Yay, all right. All right. It's on board. <laughs> well, Brett, Todd, Ty, I thank you guys for joining us so much. Everyone that's hung out in the audience, we are grateful to have you with us. If you have any follow up questions, yeah. let us know. You can get a hold of me anytime at cbeck at escogroup.org. We're going to have this video available later. We'll have it on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. We'll have it on our HVACR Learning Network available for CEUs for this show as well. And then uh, we'll see you all next oh. week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And be looking forward to some additional CO2 uh -huh. training from the ESP Institute coming later in this year. Yeah. Something so, up our there. I don't know what Thank that might did. be, but it might supplement our material. It really might well. be a great piece to add to the curriculum. And if you guys ever want to get in touch with us, hvacredu.net just as it says right there uh it's my first name todd T -O -D -D, at hvacredu.net love to hear from you uh especially instructors come come uh, come talk to me i have a great great plethora of uh, information for you as for stuff bringing stuff to the uh, some curriculum additional curriculum to your cl classroom absolutely and we can find the podcast where oh everywhere everywhere, everywhere. uh youtube facebook instagram you know, uh, on Apple and Google, uh, even on YouTube. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate this. And if you want to hang out with us and really have some deep conversations on this one-on-one, -on -one, come join us at the National HVACR Education Conference. It's going to be a great time this year. We're going to have so many great classes. And then we will, uh, we will catch you next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.